Uh, thank you for coming today to this evening. Uh, my name is Hadas Nistan and I'm the cultural and public diplomacy attaché uh, at the Israeli embassy here in Warsaw. Uh, today we actually uh, open a cycle of meetings with professionals from various fields of expertise that will inspire innovative thinking and promote a sustainable future. We will call this cycle World Changer Night. So this is a first meeting and we cannot wait for the second, I can just assume. Um, today is the first edition of the project, Future is Female. Um, will be dedicated, of course, to the Women's Day that will be uh, in two days from now. Um, and of course, today we will talk uh, on the future, on the future uh, with renowned uh, experts on the occasion of the International Women's Day. Uh, we have a special guest that arrived from Israel just today. We just, uh, yeah, I just heard that he, she almost, oh, we need to now. Um, just very uh, important fact about Ornit is that she, she speaks seven languages and I hope that we will hear at least few of them today, right? No Polish. No Polish? No Polish? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's, um, she will speak about the future of fintech. Uh, she had city ventures in Israel and she's an ex-entrepreneur. So we would love to hear more of it uh, in a few moments. Uh, today we have partnered with few organizations to make this event happen. Uh, we would like as an embassy to thank City and Lobby and City Service Center, uh, the Heart Warsaw that hosts us here, Digital University, Vital Voices, Center of International Relations, uh, Technology in Skirts, Serendip, Perspectivi, uh, Perspectivi Foundation and Znan Ek Experti, Women Experts Initiative. Yeah, sorry, my accent should be better, but I do my best. Thank you all for joining uh, with your knowledge and resources. Thank you all of the organizations. Um, and I would love also to thank Emil from our embassy who made extremely big efforts to make this event happen. So I would like now to invite our ambassador, Ms. Anna Zari, to address the audience. I am going around this room and, and thinking to myself that in most of those futures, my future isn't my past and I don't think I'm going to see myself. But uh, um, another thought is about eight, March 8th and this International uh, Women's Day. Uh, I grew up until I was 12 in Vilnius, Lithuania, which was part of the Soviet Union, part of this uh, subculture, and it was a completely disgusting day at which males were supposed to go down from there, uh, uh, the Olympic mountains and, I don't know, prepare a breakfast or something of the kind. And, uh, when I was serving in uh, Russia as ambassador already not so long ago, it still, you know, it um, had its capitalist switch all of a sudden when the oligarchs could buy a car or a diamond or something, but no content. The funny thing was the collapse of the communist system, uh, this day got uh, serious in, in, in the West. And I am very happy that we are turning it in, into what we are trying to do uh, today. First of all, I want to thank you for, uh, for coming to this event. Secondly, I think it's always, I'm, I don't know, intend to, um, to offend today's minority, but uh, for me it's always um, fun and nice uh, to work here in Warsaw with women, with women in tech, with women in, women in the fintech, with any tech you, you choose. Uh, uh, we enjoy incredible cooperation with different organizations. Probably the most uh, intensive one um, is uh, not sponsoring today or half sponsoring, I don't remember. Uh, Vital Voices, hi there, Alex. 
And I think that women can do um, a, a lot and better than um, anyone else, no harm meant, um, <laughs> again. And for us, we chose, in a way, to these last months of female Israeli embassy um, to, to do as much as we will be able to do uh, with women because uh, my, uh, the person who will come after me uh, is a wonderful guy, but he's a guy. <laughs> Nobody is perfect. So I, th I want to thank everybody to wish all of us a, a, a great in, and fruitful uh, evening and to continue uh, this, um, um, this uh, project um, in many different and creative ways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Anna Azari. And now I would like to invite to the stage the CEO of, of, CEO of Citibank uh, in Poland, uh, Mr. Suavomir Sikora. Good evening. Uh, Her Excellency uh, Ambassador, thank you for this kind of invitation. And uh, I can confirm I'm not a woman. I'm not sorry for that because I, I believe that uh, men have something to do as well, promoting women. And uh, I wanted to reflect on that maybe in my uh, short intro. Uh, I have two, two observations which I wanted to share. First, it's coming from the fact that uh, I was born and raised in a traditional Polish family. So both of my parents have been working, but my mother had been working in two jobs. Basically going as an accountant and uh, doing her jo daily job and then coming back and being a logistics manager of our family. So shopping, going to visit the school, you know, all that stuff. And it was quite natural to me. Surprisingly, it was natural to her as well, because all her predecessors have grown in the same model. Uh, so it was only um, at, when I was a teenager, I, I felt that something is wrong. And uh, when I got married, um, uh, I decided to share, or we agreed with my wife, to share uh, the responsibilities. But when I was preparing for tonight, I, was, I realized that actually I was probably the first generation of male who shared the responsibilities with the women in family. So this experience is probably not only my experience. I think many boys, even younger than me, are the first generation of male who want to share the responsibility. And it has consequences. And it's good to be aware of that, that we've grown in the tradition which is not supporting a different role for women in life, in uh, personal life and in the professional life. The second reflection which I have is about business. Actually, the, <clears throat> uh, the, the, uh, the business for me was much uh, 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 much longer a male business than it was in the family. So I realized that lack of women in the boardroom or in any room, except uh, you know for the sort of a town hall or uh, employees meeting, it, it's only about 10 years ago, maybe certainly after 2000, when I realized there, there are no women in the business. And if you think it dramatically changed, I did the review of banks. So there are 10 banks at the Warsaw Stock Exchange. And I look at the board composition, and eight of them has less than 15% of uh, female representation. Um, in spite of the fact that we've been working and talking about this problem for the last 10 years. So let me maybe share with you three uh, three uh, challenges which we are facing in business, in my opinion, which needs to be addressed. There are probably more than that, but uh, they, these are mine, and these are uh, things which I'm, with my management team, I'm trying to address. So first, how do you change the uh, sort of uh, 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 standards uh, that the men are selecting the men? So if you have a male 
boards and then you have a vacancy, then usually the men decide who will be the next. And coincidentally, they decide that the next qualified is a man. How many times I've heard, even from the uh, recruitment firm, there are no women in the market who would qualify for the senior position. Right? So that's one. Men selecting the men is one of the challenges which we are facing in business until today. The second is what I call the competence gap. We did the survey in our company, and what I've learned, surprisingly, that <clears throat> when there is a 20% gap, a woman would usually focus on the gap. So when they try to apply for the job, they focus that they are missing 20% of competences for the job. So what did they do? They say, oh, I need to work on that and apply <coughs> next time. What happens if a man has 50% gap? He usually sees this 50% which he has, as the perfectly fine to be the best candidate for the job. So if you realize that, you start thinking what you can do about it. And the third is that even talented women, grown, develop with the individual development plan, and suddenly there comes this moment when we need to appoint a woman for a senior job, which usually involves a bit longer hours, uh, a bit more stress, and then quite often we face a situation that women starts to think about her other roles in life. And if she comes from the traditional family still, she would see the new job in conflict with her traditional job. So this is the third, like why, uh, how we can support the women who feel like I need to choose whether my personal life will be sacrificed when I'm taking the, the new job, the higher job. So how do we address it? The first one, we decided to address by saying, no, there are no more situations where the men select men. So in the interviewing panels, as a mandatory, <coughs> we put women and men. So there is a view on the candidates, male and, and, and female, both from male and female in the interviewing panel. Second, we do not accept from the recruiting firm the slate where there are no women. We don't accept there are no people in the market. You are not doing your job, that's what we say, if you do not bring the female candidates so that we have a diverse slate. So that's probably there are some other ideas, but that's what we do specifically, and it worked very well um, so far. The third one which I, I would recommend is growing the female talent. Uh, so for example today, and I collected preparing for that, 72% of my directs has a female as a, in the succession plan. Right? Because if you don't uh, focus on the succession plan, then when the jobs pop up, usually you have, no, we don't have women who would qualify for the job. And if you yeah, including myself. Uh, so uh, <laughs> so that, that's succession plan and early planning helps to bring women. And it could be at every managerial position. It brings the uh, uh, female talent to the top of the organization. In terms of competence, I think that's a, a very good tool which uh, proved to work in our organization is the coaching. So to make the case, I met every single uh, board member of my organization to, to do the coaching of the uh, female talent so that they sort of develop the, the skills to assess, to understand, to show more empathy. And uh, coaching generally and explaining to a female this, you know, your 20% gap is actually development opportunity and this 80 is more than probably most of the candidates represent. I think this small thing in coaching helps a lot that the women will raise their hand and say, okay, I want to, uh, to be in the interviews. And the uh, third one is this conflict between my role at home and my role in the company. And here, I believe that the future of work is uh, the flexible uh, work time. So that we will not be like uh, anchored to the desk for eight hours or longer to do our job. And I think that the technology uh, helps 
uh, helps, uh, but it's also the mentality of managers. The managers in parallel on facing the challenge that they say, yeah, how do I know that they are actually working? And as we know, in Poland, there is a low level of trust. So we tend to <coughs> not trust until proved otherwise. So when it comes to the flexible work time, there is this concern which we need to address. So those are my three ideas for the barriers which I identified while uh, uh, living my uh, professional life. And uh, last but not least, and uh, thank you, Madam Ambassador, that you uh, reminded me that uh, I had a speech with, uh, on the, upon the invitation of uh, Vital Voices, and I mentioned how, uh, how important it was for me to have a daughter. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in her case, when uh, she was like growing, and suddenly she uh, came to the age where she's looking at the... Um, at the labor market and looking for the job, as a father you realize that you don't want her to be interviewed by a manager with a bias. And I think for many male, it's an uh, absolutely unique experience. So I do recommend that the families have uh, women in the family, that helps the men. <laughs> and uh, this is not 500 plus in the new version. <laughs> Uh, and uh, my last uh, uh, comment would be, the future is female, but I strongly believe men have job to do to enable that and take it as my commitment. Thank you. Much, thank you very much, Mr. Sikora, for your words. And now I would like to invite our friend, the Deputy Director of Elmet Poland, <laughs> Miss Katarzyna Piedzak. Hi, I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight on behalf of Elmet Poland. And uh, we are just uh, uh, amazed that we can start this cycle with you, Wall Strangers Night. And uh, everything was set, I think, so I will not enjoy. Thank you so much. <laughs> And now it's time that we waited to hear you, Ornichinar, the keynote speaker. Proszę. <laughs> no pressure. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. And while it's true that I speak seven languages, I didn't bring a voice, so please bear with me. Um, and I, we can speak many languages, Polish is not one of them. I'm happy to take on the challenge and work on it, but for now, um, we'll have to stick to some of the other ones. So, um, I'll start by saying a few words um, about myself, just uh, to, to set the context. So, I've been working at City for many years now, but I'm not a banker. I've never been a banker. And I started out actually as a lawyer. And I know I should apologize for this, so please forgive me and don't tell anyone else this terrible, terrible secret about me. Um, but I did do good things. I started out working in the Supreme Court, working for uh, Aaron Barak, who's considered a revolutionary uh, legal mind globally, uh, who changed the way the, the legal structure was set up in Israel. And then I worked in an NGO that was fighting corruption in government, again, something that was breaking all the, the rules and conceptions of how things were done. And at the time, my boyfriend said to me, yeah, but what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, Don Quixote is limited in its uh, applications. And I said, well, I want to work with people. I want to do stuff that's not always fighting all the time. I don't want to be a lawyer. And it was 1997, 1998. I'm still 28, by the way. Um, um, and, um, and at the time, Israel was just starting out in the, the high-tech boom were a few early successes and it was very exciting. He said, well, if you don't know what you want to do, but you want to do stuff with people, go to high tech. And my first job interview, uh, that, well, there were a few flops, but the first one that was a bit more successful, um, the guy that interviewed me was a VP of sales and he said, you want to do sales or marketing? So I looked at him and I said, well, what's the difference? He said, go do sales. Um, and, and that's kind of the beginning of everything. I think this statement of what's the difference 
is about looking at things and saying, let's just get it done. Who cares what the process is? We'll do whatever is required to do it and let's start doing what's required. Um, I went on from there to set up uh, a few startups. I was involved, uh, so the one by the way, that one uh, we started with 35 people sitting in a chicken coop in a village about 40 minutes from Tel Aviv. Um, a year later, it was a publicly traded company on NASDAQ. Uh, it was amazing. We felt we were on top of the world. And a year after that, the company was uh, basically selling all of its assets to another company, um, very much in trouble and looking to reinvent itself. It went to do well again and badly again in the story of the high-tech industry, but we got to, uh, to enjoy the first row seat of the bubble burst of 2001. Rolling forward, I just created a few other startups. 2007, uh, six, seven, uh, I created WhatsApp. Before WhatsApp, timing is everything in life. It didn't work out for us. Um, we did sell the company, but we learned a lot from how to sell a company. It was not a good sale. Then I set up another company, and I was sure I was going to share all these wisdoms that I had learned from uh, uh, my experiences with other startups. But uh, at the time, what happened is Sony came to me and said, hey, can you come and... Uh, work with us, you understand startups, let's see if you can bring them to the table and do stuff with us. And uh, a year after that, more or less, City came to me and said, well, could you help us set up something in the FinTech space? So I'm rolling into the City world now. So Israel is, uh, is touted as being the startup nation. And the reason we got that nickname is because of a book that was written in 2004 or five where they'd interviewed a lot of people. There were lots of M&As, there was lots of IPOs, a tiny country with a ton of PR about what's happening in that space. And after the book, everyone in, in the globe pretty much came to visit Israel. Um, some just came to visit. Some actually came and opened up offices in Israel. And when I'm saying some, we're talking about hundreds of multinational companies that came and changed the face of this country. So from a country that was agricultural by nature, it became a country that was technological by nature. From a country where you could get a salary of X in tech, suddenly our salaries doubled. I wasn't complaining. Um, the whole uh, interface, the whole industry changed completely the way it was behaving. But what happened was all these people were coming to visit and the government very intelligently said, well, this is great for us. It's doing good stuff for the economy, but we're in trouble. And the reason they thought we were in trouble was because all these other countries were coming and learning from us how to do this. And our natural advantage, the way we were doing things that was unique to us, was no longer unique. Everyone else was going to close this gap within two, maybe three years. And so the government looked at what they could do to change this. And they understood, I think, and I agree with their conclusion, that in spaces where we were already in a very strong position, their extra value was not that substantial. But in areas where we hadn't done that much yet, it was where they could be uh, very impactful. And they pinpointed three areas. And for the people that were here this morning, apologies. Um, so the three areas they focus on are agri-tech, food tech, and fintech. So I'm, of course, going to focus on fintech. Um, and these were very weird years to focus on fintech. This is 2007, 2008. Most of you have probably uh, heard of what was happening around the world in this uh, uh, space. And for the government to double down on a space that was going through uh, a lot of upheaval was, uh, I want to say, very forward looking. And what they did is they uh, decided that they were going to bring international banks and have them open R&D centers in Israel. And the reason for that was that we had local banks and they're great, they're big, relatively speaking, but on a global level, they weren't very large players and they're not typically uh, big players on the R&D space. They, they do more buy than build. As a result of that, most of the technologies we were seeing in, the, in Israel were not core banking technologies. And rolling forward, when we came in 2013, we were still seeing most of the technologies as things that people went to the bank, they stood in line, it was frustrating. So what can we do to resolve this? Maybe we can cash checks remotely, maybe we can do things uh, uh, through uh, the mobile phone but it wasn't core banking as such. So two banks came to Israel at the time, City being one of them, and we opened up an R&D lab in 2011. 
And uh, we, those were city developers developing for city. And at first everyone was happy. We were uh, using this, you know, startup nation brain power and integrating into, uh, into a city. But two things occurred. One, it was very, very hard to recruit people. And it was hard to recruit people because people thought that coming to work for us meant um, doing boring stuff. You know, I don't remember the password to my account. Can you help me read, you know, uh, get a new password? Who wants to do that? If you're a super smart data scientist, you want to do more than that. So we had to show them that FinTech was actually a super exciting space that was completely changing and was very exciting and a lot could happen in there. And the second thing that uh, uh, we saw was that we were recruiting so by 2012, there were 30 people. When I, I started working with C, there were 30 people. It's nice, but it's just 30 people. It doesn't get you to really, really engage with the ecosystem. So a friend of mine was working for City. They started looking for someone who could engage with the ecosystem. And he said, you know, I have a friend. She just did this for Sony. You guys should talk to her. And as I said, at the time I had a company. So they talked to me and said, can you give us your consulting services? And I said, sure. And they said, what would you like? I asked them, what would you like to do? I said, well, I don't know, an accelerator, an incubator. Do something to engage with uh, the local ecosystem so that we can leverage it better, so that we can recruit more as easily, so that people understand that city is at the forefront of technology in this space. And I said, sounds interesting. In my head, I was going, what is FinTech? But and it's not that I was so, so ignorant, because just so we understand each other, I had done my homework. I'd gone into Google, I'd written FinTech in Israel, and I'd found four citations in Google. That was it. So yes, I could have searched more probably, but there wasn't much more to search. Um, so I went about thinking what I understood from a bank, and as I said, I'm not a banker. So when they were asking me about ideas, my ideas were also very you know, user-centric, if you will. Um, but what I taught them is, uh, let's start by creating First of all, um, a knowledge base. We started talking to people within city, but also within other organizations with which we were um, friendly and brought them to talk to entrepreneurs. Anyone was invited. And for a bank 2013, the revolutionary thing was that we were telling them, maybe we're beating them over the head and saying, share your challenges with us. Tell us what it is that's really hurting you because you cannot on the one hand complain that the solutions you're getting are not key to what you want, and on the other hand, not share what it is that you would like to see. So I think rolling forward, this has changed and people understand this intrinsically today, but it was a, an uphill struggle to get to that point. The second thing that we did was we created a, a program, and it's a four-month program during which startups work with us, and we needed people to uh, engage with them within city. And there were many challenges with that, first of all, me choosing the startups is nice, but as I said, not a banker, don't know what to choose. How am I going to make sure that I'm choosing the best startups for city? Secondly, this is a global enterprise and I'm sitting in the middle of the desert in this tiny country far away from any of the hubs. How am I going to uh, make sure that the hubs hear about what it is that we're doing? And the third challenge was, so we're doing all of this and then how do we get it to be integrated into our organization? So the first thing that I did was go to the main sponsor of the program and say, listen, I need help. And he said, what help do you need? I said, well, I want you guys to be the selection committee. So we created a Shark Tank-like um, event during which the startups would pitch the most senior people within the organization in the different business units and have them say, this is interesting or this is of no value. The second thing I did is I said, okay, that's great, but now that you've selected it, you've got to put your money where your mouth is, I need you to spend 30 to 60 minutes a week with each one of these people and mentor them. It's very hard to say no to 30 minutes. And they did choose them, right? I mean, now they've got to show that it actually has value. So they agreed. So then I spent a few months writing articles. Now I'm no journalist, but we have an intranet. And I was writing all these articles in which I was tagging all these senior people and saying, Look how amazing a job they're doing and how much fun it is and how much value these seniors are getting out of this thing. And lo and behold, all these other people in the city started saying, I want to be engaged with all these seniors. Can I be a part of this program? And they started thinking, hey, all this innovation, this is actually quite cool. Maybe we can do something with this. 
And the third thing I did is when we were selecting companies, I thought, I just thought we needed. And I thought we needed them because it could be a variety of reasons, right? I could think it was an amazing team and all these bankers, they were right about what's key to city, but I knew better on what's an amazing team and maybe we could redirect them into something cool. It could be because I wanted diversity. I didn't want all identical people around the table. And then people would turn around to me and say, you talk about diversity. Uh, that's maybe what I didn't mention. So when I was doing my first startup, the first thing I did was uh, with another entrepreneur and then later on with a VC friend, two VC friends, uh, we set up a community of uh, women entrepreneurs in Israel. And we started out by saying we wanted to have, you know, just uh, women founders and CEOs. And for a few months we met and we were six women and it was so exciting, but six women, you know, how much can we innovate and uh, inform each other? It's not impactful. So we ended up opening it up to any woman who wanted to become an entrepreneur. And today this group has thousands of women. Most of them are not entrepreneurs yet, but they're all meeting, they're getting mentoring, they're getting a lot of inspirational talks, they're getting help to open doors where necessary. So rolling back to what I was saying now, I founded that and I'm going to have not a single woman around the table. I can't do that. My reputation is at stake. This is not okay. So I needed to have this way of ensuring that I'd have women, that I'd have Arabs, that I'd have ultra-Orthodox uh, people around the table. And it turns out it wasn't that easy. So the reason it wasn't easy is because I can go knock on all the doors and say, please come and apply. But they still need to apply. And I can't force them. So my first thing to say is, you know, um, and I think Cheryl Zandberg said it's better than me, but sit at the table, lean in, uh, participate. And this is true, by the way, for all of these groups where a lot more effort is required to bring them to the table. The second thing was, and I, I have an opinion, it's not to say it's the right opinion, and it's also not to say that it is the only opinion within city. Uh, but my opinion was that I wasn't willing to take mediocre companies just because there was someone from a minority group uh, to sit at the table. So I wanted to have good companies that would showcase what can be done. I was willing to go out and promote the program, to go out of my way to convince them, but it needed to be strong, talented people that were applying. And then I would be willing to do a little bit of compromise. So those were the, the main parameters for the program. I'm happy to say that looking at uh, 2019, where uh, we just started our ninth program, so 90 companies, of the first 80 companies, they've raised $750 million between them, probably a little more by now. I keep not being able to follow these changes because they're going out and raising it. By the way, not necessarily from City at all, the vast majority of the money is not from City, but we were incremental in helping them get to the right VCs, understand what VCs to pitch and how to pitch them, but that was not our main focus. Our main focus was in helping them understand what the products were, how to understand what was key for an organization such as ours, and endlessly opening doors for them, both within city and within other organizations. City adopted many of these technologies, not enough, but that's my job to say not enough, right? Uh, people keep told, telling me, so do you think uh, people should be doing more innovation? Yeah, otherwise I'll be out of a job. Of course, more innovation, um, but it's, uh, it's difficult to change things. And within an organization, not every group is as open to make these changes, um, but we've been making changes. And one of the things I can tell you is um, I left City and then they called me back in 2017 and said, can you come open our uh, venture investing activity now? And when I left, I, I, I cried in my boss's office, literally real tears. I was shattered because I loved my job so much, but I felt I'd done my job. It was up and running. Everything was fine. I was offered a really, really great opportunity in another company. It was time to move on. And uh, they then asked me, so what will it take for you to come back? And I said, if you do venture investing, then it'll be time for me to come back. I adore this company, but I have to look out for my career and what I need to do going forward. So in 2017, I get a phone call from the CEO of City Israel and he says, now, Now's the time, come back. So I came back and the day before I started, my then boss um, was visiting Israel and he said, uh, can you come visit me? So I'll see you before, you know, as you're starting. I said, of course, and I come and he says, listen, 
I'm really not happy with what your team is doing. Welcome to City. What can I do with this? I haven't even started yet, right? So um, I spoke to him and I said, well, I understand now. Can you tell me what it is that you're not happy with? And he said, well, you're doing a lot of innovation. You're bringing value to all these other groups within City, but I'm not getting anything out of this. So I said, okay, this is a, a valid point. I don't know what's happening. Let me go in, actually find out what's going on, and I'll come back to you with a, uh, you know, an educated answer promptly. And three months later, he was in Israel, and we sit in a meeting, and I said, listen, uh, I can't work with you, and I can't bring you value. Not a happy camper. There was a silence in the room at that point. And he says, why? I said, well, every time I talk to anyone in your team, Everyone says we want to develop our own things. We want to grow innovation within our own group. So I thought, okay, well, what do you want from me? I do external innovation. I don't develop things internally. So again, he stopped and I was very lucky because he was an intelligent guy and he decided to listen to what I was saying and not just, you know, show me the door. And he said, uh, you know what, you have a valid point. So, so if you want my help, and I'd love to help you, can you tell me what areas you would want us to focus on where you think you would be interested in external innovation, where we're not going to get this pushback? And he came back with an answer, very specific, of, very specific, not in terms of a technology, but of a space where he was more than happy to consume external innovation. And we started focusing on that area and hopefully we're getting a few successes there uh, as we speak. But this is an ongoing process where we're always engaging with the businesses, trying to understand what they want, how we can help them do better, how we can educate them in, in terms of what is happening outside and show them what it is that we can do internally and where it doesn't make sense to do things internally. But we also need to listen because it doesn't make sense to do everything externally. Some of the stuff should be done internally. So I'll give you an example. If we're talking about a core, core banking technology that differentiates between us and our competitors, we should be developing it ourselves. There's no point in trying to do it from the outside. <coughs> Apologies. <coughs> so here's what we did. We looked at who the big players were in the space. And the very big ones we try and help. <coughs> well, it's going to be challenging. The smaller ones, we can help more directly because they don't have the tools to engage. And so we'll bring them into the accelerator. The other ones, we engage with them from a business development perspective and we help them get to the right people within city. And it might sound trivial, but when you have 220,000 people in an organization and no real directory to speak of, it's a very hard job to find the right person when you're inside city. It's beyond challenging if you're outside the organization. So I've got my colleagues here, I'm sure they'll agree with me. Um, and everyone's interested. And by the way, that's one of the biggest changes I saw in cities. So if you look at 2013, 2014, versus 2017 to 19 that have been there, if at 2013, 14, we needed to beat people over the head to understand they need to be open. When I came back, it was a changed organization. From top to bottom, management had said, we want to embrace innovation. We want to embrace change and everyone we went to said, how can I help? What can I do? It had been understood that it was a KPI, a key performance indicator, for any person within the organization to show that they had done something to better the organization, to better the service we can offer our clients, to broaden the reach and the applications of what we're doing as a company. So, amazing. So this is what we had to start with, right? With the word big successes in Israel before we did anything. But this is what we ended up doing. These are some of the companies that are today graduates of the Accelerator. There's five or six exits already. The recent, most recent one IPO'd on the ASX and is now worth 200 and something million Australian dollars. City has no take in this. So this was the other big thing that we did. I went to all of my bosses and I said, when we set up this program, it has to be pro bono. And they looked at me going, who did we recruit for this? She's nuts. We don't do pro bono. Um, and I explained this and we want to really, really help create an ecosystem. 
We want to do it from the start. Most of these startups you don't even find particularly relevant to your business. So why are we even taking anything from them? Let's work with them and if and when they're relevant, we can invest in them, we can engage with them commercially, we have tools to do that. But in the meantime, let's just help them. And they thought, you know what? It's just one headcount in Israel, whatever, okay. Um, the other part was that it was much easier to get it off the ground because there were all these other people who had jobs and because we were doing it like this, we weren't stepping on anyone's toes, right? We were doing it without bringing any specific value. So the good news is that a lot of these companies were brought into city and created impact. How so many people were listening? Why are we doing this pro bono? And that's how we got... So if you look, we have companies like... Uh, um, uh, I'm looking for the big one. So Big ID raised $50 million. Stateray Ray is a very successful company today. Uh, cool is doing well. Um, there's Forter somewhere around here. I saw them there. Um, Split It is the company I told you that uh, went public. So these companies are well-known names in the industry. And now they're going, hey, okay, we've got to pay attention to what's happening in that little country somewhere in the Middle East. <coughs> so then we started the investments. So I came back and I thought, I know City. This is going to be easy. Famous last words, of course. I now had four bosses for four different businesses who all thought they owned me and had the right to tell me what it is that needed to be done. At any given point of time, I cannot make sure all of them are happy. So my challenge is to make sure that I have two or three at least on my site and hopefully that they're rotating so that someone always feels that they got something out of it. I also fought very, very hard to convince City to do venture investing in early stage companies because I thought it was the smart thing to do. City doesn't do that. They agreed, I won the battle, but we ended up not really doing these types of investments because it wasn't the right DNA. So first point for me was, it's not about what I think is right, it's about listening to my organization and understanding what's right for the organization and trying to apply that. And then I arrived, I'd done investments, I'd done these great things, and I found out nobody trusted me in City to do investments. Now they just brought me for the job. What do you mean you don't trust me to do the job? This is a job where you have to show that you understand what the rationale of the organization is and convince them that you're applying their thoughts and their concepts before they let you spend their money. And we're not talking about tens or, th or of thousands or hundreds of thousands, this is millions. So they really want you to trust, to feel like they trust you. So I'm very happy to say that in the two years that I've been there, we've done five investments, which is from a venture investment perspective, you know, on par with uh, active VCs. Um, to uh, my colleague's point earlier on, um, I don't have nights, literally. My colleagues are in California. That's a 10 hour difference. Um, it's not easy, but I take those calls from home, often with pajamas in the bottom and elegant clothing on top. Um, <laughs> And it's okay. And recently I was on a conference call with them and as I was in the middle of pitching a company that I thought we should invest, my 16 year old daughter decided she was going out and she comes and on screen gives me this big kiss and my jaw just dropped and I was like, and now I can hear them giggling on the other side. This is all on video, right? Me with my suit on top and her intruding in the screen. But I think they've all come to terms with the fact that they are catching me in very odd hours and it's okay. <coughs> they were more amused than anything. I was a little less amused, I admit, um, but it's all working out. Um, they've said that they've seen all my children, I have five of them, and at any given time, one of them is going to appear on screen walking up or down the stairs, and it's fine. Um, my husband tends to complain a little bit about all of this. Uh, from time to time, he reminds me that he's not a single father. Um, and he's not, but at the same time I can tell you the following things. Yes, almost every meal that there is in our house, he cooks. Almost every meal. Uh, first of all, because he doesn't like what I cook. Um, and secondly, because once he complained twice, I figured this is my opportunity and I said, hey, you don't like what I do, why don't you do it? You can do it so much better. Um, but I do drive the children around almost exclusively. Um, when he needs to set up play dates for the children, he says, uh, can you do, 
can you set it up? Can you call? So it's not that it's black and white. We share the, the duties very, very much. I do everything in my power to always be there for school events. And city is very accepting of these types of things. So I'll show up later. So I don't really control the nightly calls because it's with 10 people at the same time. But the morning calls I control. So the hours during which I want to be available for my kids, I do control. And very often I'll come home at around three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And yes, I'm on the phone the entire time, I admit. And everyone's complaining that I'm on the phone. But they also feel very comfortable coming saying, can I have 50 shekel? Can I go see that and that person? Can I do this? Can I do that? So it does work and its flexibility really does uh, give a solution to everyone. The 50 shekel is on a good day. Usually it's more. <laughs> and maybe the thing I'm most proud of, and uh, my colleague stole my thunder, and I don't know if you know, but he was actually uh, awarded a prize for being a, uh, one of the agents of change uh, here in Poland for promoting women's rights. And as you know from what I told you before, this is something that is, I view as being really of the utmost importance in what I do. So I'll invest in the best companies, but I want to help everyone. And I want to help in particular those that are not going to come to me and not going to be able to come to me because they no, don't qualify yet. <coughs> and City has been amazing at uh, giving me a platform and cooperating with me and letting me play at whatever I want to do. So about a year ago, I came out with an idea that everyone told me was the most ludicrous of all ideas ever. And I didn't care. And I went on promoting it and I brought in uh, companies that wanted to cooperate with us. So uh, Visa, Intuit, uh, Discount Bank in Israel and City sponsored an event where we rented out a, a blackout room, so a room that's completely pitch black. It's a restaurant. And we brought 21 startups to pitch the top VCs in Israel in the pitch dark. The VCs were 50-50 men and women. The startups were not 50-50 men and women because we just couldn't find enough of them. But we had some Arabs, we had some uh, ultra-Orthodox, we had some women. And in the dark, they had to pitch. And it was amazing. And it was amazing not because we're going to do this in the future, because we're not. It's not that we're promoting this as the way to ensure people aren't biased. But we did want to make sure people understand that you need to look past your first image of the person. And I'll take it further and I'll tell you within that it goes well beyond the examples I gave. In my first year at City, a, a guy came to me and I don't know how old he was, but my estimate, 85. <coughs> if he was younger than that, he didn't look good. <laughs> And he wanted to set up this new startup. And wow, my biases came out in full force, I have to tell you. I was in my mind, I was going, so put money behind you and next year you're not even around. Now I can't tell the guy that and it's a horrible thing to say and oh my Lord, what a terrible bias, right? So I went out of my way to open doors for him within city to make sure the idea was valid or not and get him all of the help that he could have because I figured if I'm so terrible, I've got to do everything in my power to give counteract that effect. And in that case, it was easy because it was such an obvious bias in my case, right? But very often it's not that obvious. And we wanted to make sure that the, the industry, the VCs would be aware of it. And that's why we brought all of the VCs to be uh, uh, the judges of this uh, event. And it was all over the press in Israel. It actually made uh, the internal press in city, and we had a lot of uh, follow-on conversations with many people within the organization who also wanted to understand how we did it and what, what we did. So it's not to say that all the people involved or all the people that heard about it no longer have conscious or unconscious biases. I promise you, they still do. But we hope that with things like this, we make each and every one of us a little bit more conscious of what it is that affects us and how we can try and give people a chance and counteract what it is that we're doing in that way. The other thing that we learned from this is, so I, I was a geek in school. I was always you know, in the front row asking questions, sorry. And suddenly now I'm sitting with all these startups and all these people lecturing. And half the time I'm wondering whether I have ADHD. And I'm wondering because, I think partly because technology has turned me into an ADHD type person more than six, 
say 60 seconds and I'm bored. <coughs> but secondly, because people don't speak very well and they don't know what they're doing in an efficient enough way. And all these people were pitching. So seven startups in one shot, each around tables. And you're going to be doing this soon where you'll have many tables with conversations happening at the same time. And I challenge you to try and see how hard it is to concentrate at what's happening at your table and not eavesdrop or get distracted by what's happening elsewhere. So imagine now you're judging a startup and you need to do this and it's pitch dark and your only sense, well, it's not the only one, smell is also there, I admit. <laughs> but your main sense is listening, right? And the poor startup has to pitch and for the first time in their lives, they have no help, no PowerPoint presentations. As you see, I'm terrible, I'm not even moving mine. They don't have mobile phones to showcase what they're doing, nothing. And they have to talk and all these other people are talking at the same time. And I can tell you, I have never in my life heard as good pitches as on that day. People were ultra focused, both the startups and the investors. <coughs> Sorry. So my last sentence to you, I think, will be just this. If you've got to take one thing from this is A, Fintech is amazing, a ton of stuff's happening and it's changing all the time. It's very broad, so when we look at it, from our perspective, we're looking at things like cybersecurity and enterprise IT, uh, financial services, obviously, but AI, machine learning, um, payments, commerce, digitization, HR technologies, you name it. And it's fascinating to see what can be done and how much can be done both within the organization as an employee and uh, within the innovation as someone who's trying to be an agent of change. The second thing I wanted to, to leave you with is a thought on what it is that each and every one of us can do to make a change. So I don't think the men have to change. Well, they do. But I don't think the women have to change. They also do, right? It's not a they did to us or we did to them. It's all preconceived ideas we all grew up with. And I can tell you that when I grew up, and I speak seven languages. And my brother speaks the same seven languages and he's three years older than me. And whenever we'd meet anyone, people would say, oh, your brother, he's going to be a great businessman. And you, wow, you'll be such a fantastic translator. <laughs> that did not go down well. <coughs> then when I said I wanted to study law, by the way, my brother studied law too. My grandparents came to me and said, that's not a profession for women. And I thought, really? And then they said, oh, when you're practicing driving, make sure your father's driving in the car with you. And I thought, interesting. That's not how I expected these people to be. Now, I have to tell you, my grandparents, clearly not very progressive, were the children of two women pharmacists and one woman, uh, well, this is because one of them had two mothers, but long stories and one woman who was a member of the Israeli, the first Israeli parliament. What went wrong? <laughs> so all I can say is we all need to be agents of change. And in order to do that, we need to look internally at what it is that we can do to change that. And the last thing I can tell you is you need a support group. So don't fight with the people around you. Try and bring them in to help you make all those changes that you want. In 2005, I decided that I was going to get a divorce. And I had a three-year-old and a four-year-old at the time. And I decided I was setting up a startup a month after I decided I was getting the divorce. Oh, and I also decided I was buying a house because it, I figured it was a really good time to do all of that. And everyone looked at me and thought I was a little bit nuts and they were probably right. Um, but my parents turned around and said, listen, you're setting up your startup. Whenever you need to travel, don't worry, we'll take the kids, you go do your thing. That's it. I didn't need anything beyond that. So I think a support system that enables you to grow, to thrive, and if you can't have someone in your family that does it, money does the same thing, right? You can pay for a babysitter. But always go out and do as much as you can. Thank you. Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas Schulhoff. I'm uh, the host here, here today here uh, as the co-founder of The Heart. 
And now we'll have an intellectual feast in front of us uh, with uh, four amazing ladies. I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, um, Ornit again. <laughs> Uh, hopefully your voice will, you'll have interruptions uh, or time to relax as other uh, um, ladies will speak as well. Uh, uh, Kamila Kalishek from MasterCard, Vice President of MasterCard, um, uh, also hosting in this building and our strategic <laughs> partner, uh, which we are very grateful for. Uh, Jovita Michalska here in front of us uh, from Digital University and Małgorzata Bonikowska uh, from Institute for International Relations, please. So please give them hands. And just to give you a small background of stories, we had an amazing meeting with, I don't know, 10 or 12 of us uh, designing that meeting as a Women's Day meeting. And it's obvious to discuss female issues. And But we decided that it's actually is not something we would like to do. We'd like to inspire you with thoughts about the future and with personal stories or inspirations about the past. So we'll not be discussing uh, the role of women or complaining or whatever will be. We'll be uh, just not inspiring you. Not this time, yes. Um, we will be more as trying to inspire you with, with, with uh, uh, great people which happen to be women. Uh, so um, we'll start with the first question which we uh, think is something that inspires us if other people point to things which we haven't seen from all the areas that you're looking for and and we have thought leaders in their spaces here among us what excites you which areas excite you about the future uh, you look at different spaces politics and and education and technology and fintech and commerce and so on what are the topics that, that really excite you right now as you look at the things around you, the weak signals around us? If I may start, <laughs> Camilla. Um, for me, the future is not only the technological revolution, uh, but it's also very, very much about the demography. Because the demography will be one of the key um, influencing uh, points that will change the economy of Poland and also of the Europe. Um, what's going on now? Uh, it's said to be, according to the different uh, analyzers and uh, experts, that the, in 30 years from now, the EU 28 countries will still have 500 million of, 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 of people, but there will be a huge drop in the working age people, like around 49 million people. Only in Germany there will be a drop, it, it, it is anticipated, of 11 million people. And in countries like Poland, Italy, Spain, between the 7 and 8 million. So what does it mean for the future? Maybe it means that the uh, diversity and inclusion will be even more uh, uh, stronger than it is now. And uh, that's like in MasterCard, for many companies, this will be one of the key competitive advantage, uh, how to survive and also how to, how to do the business in the, in the right way. Because according to the McKinsey uh, data, we know that those companies who have the diversified teams, they can uh, achieve the even 35% more profit than those who are uh, not using the strategy. And maybe it can sound a bit uh, exotic or, or scary, uh, at least in Poland, for some of the people now, but uh, there will be a big integration uh, with the Polish people, uh, with people coming from Asia, from Africa, and that would be something uh, which is real and something natural, because we have to look somewhere for the talented people. Uh, many young people from Poland leaving Poland, and uh, on, on, on the other hand, we have two millions of Ukrainian people and maybe there we also need to look for the uh, diamonds for those who have the uh, strong talents and, and can, can help in, in our industry. Uh, I, can, I can say that like, I look at my daughter now. <laughs> I think she's the future and that it's amazing really to observe how open this generation is, how amazing access to everything uh, they have, how democratized the world do we have now. I, you know that I'm a huge enthusiast of, uh, of technology, so I, I really see the, the, the bright side of it. 
Where is Europe? Where is Europe? So that's what worries me, and of course it brings me to the politics back, because politicians also have to have innovative minds. But if they try to innovate, what do they do? Well, these innovations we don't necessarily like. Like they try to buy, you know, posts in the social media to get support. It's a fake support, but that's maybe a political innovation, is it? Or they try to, you know, use uh, all the means, all the ways to convince people to vote for them. But is it very innovative? Maybe it is. But is this politics all about marketing, about communication, or it's about real vision and innovation and bringing us into the 21st century, into the future? So my worries would be when you talk about politics, politics today, international relations, I think instead of going further, we are somehow like going back. Don't you have this feeling like that, you know, everybody else talks about the, the brilliant future, the incredible possibilities we are having, but the reality in politics is that it just holds us back. It brings us to the world we want to forget, to the world of power, to the world of you know, conflict to the world of maybe even bad things like wars. So if I look at your daughter, that's not the world I want to have, right? Mm -hmm. So my dilemma, and that's what I want to discuss uh, also with men, you know, men somehow <laughs> can also help. <laughs> but that's also part of a problem, not a part of a solution. Because there are some brilliant men like Donald Trump and like <laughs> many others. And they bring us a lot of innovations <laughs> like to walls. the politics too. Like walls. <laughs> so I think and I strongly believe that we should really balance and we should really discuss all these technology aspects and the brilliant, you know, innovative thoughts and 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 things and gadgets and possibilities of technology. But also we have to discuss political, public aspect, and us, humans, because we can easily be lost into this run, into this rush, into this, you know, it's like in Africa they tell us, you have watches, but we have time. Super. Yeah, by the way, uh, I, I, I don't know still, uh, was it a, a fake advertisement or not? Because I was just in hurry looking for the internet for some information, but like three weeks ago, I saw the advertisement uh, for a job given by one of the very well-known uh, company who are producing the car that they are looking for the mid-level manager who will manage the robots. So I thought, oh my God, just just started. The future is now. <laughs> Super. Um, we are kind of running out of time. I wanted to ask you many more questions, but I will, I'll turn it into one uh, of a personal story or your lessons learned in building the future. So imagining something and actually going through the obstacles that on antibodies, especially in uh, big organizations, or really making, making change happen either in the world of politics or in business or in startups. What are your personal lessons learned from stuff you've done or you've experienced somehow happening that might inspire our, our guests here today uh, from your, your story, uh, any of them. Okay, <laughs> maybe I will also start. So um, I think that the uh, change is unavoidable, it's, it's just something that cannot be postponed. So uh, in many projects that uh, we have been done as MasterCut, the lesson learned was that the uh, Change is, well, you cannot uh, reject uh, the change and you cannot be uh, anxious or uh, angry about it. This is something that uh, you have to have in a DNA. So you have to be the company and you have to be the person that is change oriented. Only in this way you can survive. And uh, in many of our, our, our projects, uh, we just uh, experienced this, even in cooperation with the heart. 
uh, when we are investing a lot in the hard ventures that you are just um, creating a few of them meanwhile. So the cooperation uh, the, with the, between the big company and the scale-ups who can bring you completely new model of the uh, doing the business of organization because you know the organizations normally the big ones they don't know how to innovate neither the banks or the corporations so the first thing is just to be very much change oriented and it is not only the mindset but mindset is just the beginning but then also it's something what really has to be done and the another thing is just not to wait for the possible opportunities that may come when they just create them so this is also something what uh, we are we are we are doing in a, in a, in a mastercard the example is because i'm coming from payment system maybe the something that you are touching every day the contactless payments this is something that has been done 10 years ago and now no one can imagine to live without it. More than 85% of all transactions in Poland has been done in, in this way and it's growing every, every few percent every quarter. But at the beginning you cannot imagine what, what has happened, what the people has in mind, even in our company because Poland is still the number one regarding the contactless numbers, terminals and, and, and cards uh, with this technology, still number one worldwide. And, and what, what, what we have in mind, we as the company here in Poland decided that uh, we would like to do our competitive advantage versus the others through implementing new services and new technology not the technology like a flower to decode something nice but but the technology that could be helpful useful and make the uh, people's life easier and convenience but also very safety but at the beginning the technology was you cannot maybe even re re remember that there were a, a big hate and afraid among the customers among the users among the media how it is possible that just by tapping uh, for a few seconds the card uh, at, the, at the terminal uh, it can be safety they just simply didn't uh, trust and didn't believe that within the few seconds all the cryptograms unique transaction code algorithms can be uh, re uh, exchanged and, and it, it is really something uh, safety and more on that even you know in Poland we are very um, smart people and, and wise and have a lot of um, different initiatives so there were some innovators in, in brackets let's say some entrepreneurs who just were using this situation and very uh, loudly through internet but also through media passed the information that having the contactless card it's really uh, fraudulent and it's not um, safety when you are uh, in the crowded tram or bus some person with the terminal can simply steal the money from your contactless card from your wallet or handbag but the only thing that will protect you from that is just the special plastic cover from me as the new entrepreneur you can buy it just for five euro and it will save your life. So, so, so you know, uh, many of such a things. And we were also a lot of discussions, having a lot of discussions with the uh, police supervision committee. How come that we are implementing such a technology into the Polish market? But anyway, now after 10 years, no one can imagine that, that it, it, it could be something different. People, uh, let's say, voted by Lex. It, it's it's just saying in Poland, so just simply using this and showing that they like it. So the lesson learned it was just not not wait for the opportunities, just do it. And if you really believe in something and uh, spend a lot of time and and resource, and you are sure about the quality of the product it will success you never know how quickly but anyway it it will happen so these are the lessons learned so if i were to look at it and i'll be very brief because you've heard too much from me today already is uh, is always learn and there's no age for learning there's no age 
where you know enough and you've done enough and nobody else has anything more interesting to say. And learning can come in the form of books, articles, websites, etc. Be careful from fake news, of course. But it can come from talking to people and we meet interesting and knowledgeable people everywhere, all the time. And I think as long as you remember that you have a lot to learn, you can get to do a lot of things with it. And just one little example, I had this pet peeve a couple of years ago regarding a company that I thought was fascinating. And what they were doing was IoT servers, uh, sorry, sensors for containers. And I said, this is the first company we're going to invest in in Israel. And everyone said, this isn't FinTech. And I said, what do you mean? This is exactly FinTech. This is key for the bank. And I went to the risk department and they said, how is this even relevant for us? And I started talking and talking and talking to people within the industry, within shipping, within our clients, until I managed to convince, to learn enough, by the way, to be able to convince other people. But then I managed to convince the people within the organization that this was key for city. And we ended up investing in the company, very half-heartedly with a lot of people going, uh. but five minutes later, suddenly people went, oh, actually we can use it for this and we can use it for that. And suddenly it became a strategic investment for the organization. They suddenly learned about it. But the only way we could have done it was by learning about shipping containers, not my world, to learn about uh, digitization of that entire process, to learn about the needs of the financial institutions where they need to finance these organizations. So reading, 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 talking to people, not being shy, never being shy. So you ask the dumb question. I promise you, you'll remember it for a long time, but the person on the other side They'll forget that it was a dumb question. They'll forget that you asked it. Uh, so don't never be shy and just go out and do things and try and, and be passionate about what you want to achieve because that's how you're going to achieve it. Rita? Mm, I think the, the easiest way for me to uh, talk about from the personal perspective. Uh, and I'd like to build also on what you've said. I, uh, by the way, I loved what you were talking about. Uh, <clears throat> I spent the first 20 years of my professional career in the corporate world, mostly in telco and then some years in uh, energy as well. And uh, I get, got bored somehow. And I wanted to, I, I really, I wanted to learn a bit about the new technologies because I've heard that there is something interesting from the perspective of strategy and, uh, and, and how, how certain technologies will, will uh, really influence our world and I thought that inside of the organization it's much harder to, to learn it. So I went outside, I uh, together with, uh, with two of my friends, I started foundation and uh, really we started from the scratches because I, I didn't have anything in common with the education world. Uh, also, um, I was responsible for marketing mostly, some, sometimes for HR, but not, not, no educational uh, background. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I've learned technology mostly by myself. Of course, then, then we joined Singularity University and got some education from them. But I'm waking up at 5 a.m. because I uh, have to have uh, like at least an hour or two a day to read, uh, sometimes to write, but mostly to read, to listen to podcasts and uh, to really um, sometimes to learn completely new things. From, for example, uh, how to write, how to, you know, drive a scooter or sometimes how to make origami because this creates certain like amount of worlds in your <laughs> amount of words in your head that you can use because mostly what we do it and why it's so difficult to innovate uh, because lots of people they have they are in the same shoes for all the time they they are work for banking so they work for banking they work for FMCG, so the whole life they spend in FMCG. And uh, usually outside work, they don't have like hundreds of hobbies. I, usually when I hire, uh, and my people, some of my people are here so they know it, I always ask, do you have a strong hobby? Because I think people, if, if you have like similar candidates, I always pick the one with a strong hobby because I think these people are more interesting. Um, and I think being rebel is also important. I've been a rebel for, for all of my years. And I think like digging and um, trying to uh, trying to prove to yourself that you can do it in a different way. You can you can do, or, or if or I, I always like when people say to me that it can't be done or it, or it was done before and it didn't work. I love what they're doing because this speeds me up in proving 
that there is that there is a way that that there is a possibility, and so I think that um, really we can all be the change. We can all do do this for ourselves because it's only it, it belongs to us. You know, uh, in in uh, Singularity University, we say that there is only way you can uh, surf on top of the tsunami coming or you can be crushed by it. So I think it's much better to try to surf on top of the tsunami. So sometimes you, you, you can say you, you know how to surf, sometimes you have boards, sometimes you don't have, but this is the only way for all of us. So, and uh, I read one book a, a week and it requires only 45 minutes a day. So it's doable when you, when you think this way. When you create a good habit. Yes. So that's from my side. Okay, so from my side, quickly, because I know we have to finish, uh, my lessons learned are, I maybe concentrate on three points. First, if you really want to talk about innovations, please first check if everything else, which is not very innovative, which is maybe very standard, works properly. Like here where we do, you know, event, everything works, microphone works, you know, PowerPoint works, but there are many conferences where I can see, you know, that we talk about such an innovative future and then suddenly we don't have a mic. <laughs> so first rule is, okay, let's be innovative, but first let's, let's just check if the world of today we are able to control well. Fix the okay, basics. fix the basics, yeah. Second lessons are, lessons are, uh, lesson I've learned is um, that we definitely uh, have to, and I agree with you, go beyond our borders. You know, like, you can compare it to traveling. <laughs> Just not sit in your country all the time. Travel, go elsewhere, see, and then go back and use it in your own way, customize. In the business way, a world would be to change, to, to, to change the disciplines, to try, not, maybe not necessarily change the work so often, but at least be open for the people from other sectors. For example, myself, I used to work in the ministry. I was a civil servant and it was a very good lesson I got. That was not my world, but I still remember what I've learned. Then I switched into academic world and I'm still there. But then in the same time, I started to run my consultancy business. Then I started to run a think tank. Then I was a consultant. And I see on my own example that all these kinds of jobs helped me to see the same domain, which is international relations or political science, but from different perspective. So that's very important and that's also very easy because instead of learning from the book or from the internet, you, you learn from your own observation. It's very practical and you also talk to the other people, like you said, talking and learning all the time. And three, last, I think we have an extremely interesting time that we really can learn a lot from children and from young people. Maybe it's really in such a scale, the first time in history, that this reverse mentoring is needed, that we really have to listen to the new generations, which are already many, because the, the people of age of 20 are different already from the children of age of 10, and you know those who are born now, it will be slightly different too. And I think they will tell us a lot of interesting stories and we should really listen because our world is different and we remember certain things they will never experience. And I think the future, it will be in between of all these memories and generations needs to come. Uh, if I might just add one point for myself, even though I'm not a woman, um, but you've mentioned children and, and I just want to share one personal lesson from the, just the recent months uh, about children, uh, which I've learned. Uh, and as some of you know, the heart is venture building. So, so we build new companies uh, with corporations like MasterCard. But recently we decided we want to build actually an NGO or, or a social business. Because, together with my wife that was here, we, we were parents in the children's hospital, Centrum Zdravidzicka, that some of you visited. And I was so frustrated. I felt like going back to the communist times, because the hospital is 40 years old, still has boss area, so the, 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 the everywhere, and so on and so on. And you came back, the customer service is 
uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not speaking of doctors, but in general of the whole experience is like from the from the 80s or 70s when I was born. And we said, yeah, something, something. We just need to do something about it. And I started talking to different people. And now on June 1st, we'll be starting a huge foundation, a daughter or sister foundation of Wosh, which was also started at, at Central Zrojewska with Jovita and, and 80 or 90 uh, more corporations. Right now we are launching this. And it's the one lesson that I've learned so far. We are just launching it, but, but it's just amazing what happens when you start working on a project like that, which is a side project. It takes a lot of your time and energy, but it's so rewarding. Uh, and one lesson that I've learned from this is it just it's amazing if uh, what what can you achieve and what, what you can build if you don't care who takes the credit if you just take a problem that's just a common problem and just want to do something about it so that was our lesson so um thank you very much it was great to talk to you and now actually i will i let's and thank you let's let's thank, 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 thank our you. panelists uh, and let's ask emil to tell us what will happen next yes. thank you thank you so much so quickly, we would like to pass on to, to go to the roundtables that we uh, that we spoke about. You are all sitting at uh, seats with uh, with moderators on topics of finance, innovation, and back uh, cybersecurity politics. With and um, please find if you do want to sit somewhere else, please switch it now. But I will try to introduce you uh, to a small introduction to the roundtables. We would like to, uh, first of all, Israel is about, uh, is about undermining the, uh, the authority. So we would like you to be a part of the discussion and uh, we would like your participation in it. 